I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. Well, that was Catherine, Princess of Wales, who announced one week ago today that she has cancer. Now, like Kate, we all put our trust in our doctors, our hope in new research, and we are doing that at our own risk. And that has a lot to do with a series of retracted medical research articles involving fabricated figures, manipulated data, and flawed findings. New detection tools powered by artificial intelligence have lifted the lid on what some are calling an epidemic of fraud in medical research and publishing. Last year, the number of papers retracted by research journals topped 10,000 for the first time. One case involved the chief of cancer surgery division at Columbia University's medical center. An investigation found that dozens of his cancer treatment studies contained dubious data and recycled images. Other scandals have hit Harvard on the East Coast and on the West Coast. It was Stanford University. A scandal there resulted in the resignation of that school's president last year. Well, to talk more about this, I'm joined tonight by Arthur Kaplan. He is the Director of Medical Ethics at NYU's Langone Medical Center in New York City. Mr. Kaplan, it's good to see you. Appreciate you taking the time to talk with us on this Friday. Were you shocked when you learned about these cases? Sadly, I was not. We have had fraud case after fraud case being unveiled in the U.S., in the Netherlands, indeed around the world. There are many journals complicit. They will publish what you pay them to publish. Mm. They don't really do careful peer review. My colleague, Ivan Aransky, runs a center here in my program at NYU called Retraction Watch. Mm -hmm. He thinks there are tens of thousands more papers to be uh, yet to be discovered that are fraudulent. And for viewers thinking about this saying, well, you know, that's a science problem. As you started to say, Brent, it's not a victimless crime. Doctors base their treatments on the published literature. Patients try to look at the journals to see where the latest research might be for their disease that might help them. Mm -hmm. If this uh, kind of uh, falsity gets into the literature, it really hurts people with diseases and it really fouls up their best treatment. Well, you know, you, if you say this could be the tip of the iceberg here, tens of thousands of articles need to be retracted, possibly. If that is the case, well, what does that tell us then about the credibility of, of just the, the body of new medical research that is on offer right now? Well, we have to be a little careful about rushing to the first announcement of a breakthrough, whether it's a pig kidney going into a recipient or hearing about an Alzheimer's drug that seems to have great results. The real test of science is replication, not just the first publication. So until things get repeated two or three or four times by different groups and teams, one wants to be a bit wary of just jumping after the latest announcement. By the way, I'll throw this in. Yeah. That's even true for the media. Sometimes yeah. we get a little uh, over-enthusiastic about the sure. first and who's first. Yeah. That isn't really the way science operates. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a valid point we were talking about earlier. You know, why do, why do we miss these stories or why do we not follow through? I mean, th there is culpability here to, to go around. Um, I'm wondering, though, why does this keep happening? Um, and does everyone who is involved, I'm thinking about all the, the names that are listed as co-authors um, in these articles that are published, do all of these researchers and doctors, do they all understand the experiments being performed that has their name on them? Well, sadly, some of the people on those papers are junior. They're not willing to cross swords with a senior investigator who may control their career. So normally you'd have some checks and balances, but sometimes they're not there. 
The other reason that we have, if you will, a proliferation is there's huge pressure on these days to keep publishing. Mm. Research money is somewhat flat and the pressure is on there to get those papers out. I think we have to pay attention to that as well. We can't just count how many papers a person has when they're trying to get a tenured position, let's say in Turkey or Canada or the US or Germany, yeah. we also want to know, are they good quality? Yeah, publish or perish. We've heard that, everyone knows right. that's the reality, but do universities, research hospitals, do they aggressively pursue, prosecute and weed out fraudsters? I mean, are, are they actively looking for the bad apples? Well, again, I think we have to do better. Each institution is somewhat protective of its reputation, somewhat protective of not wanting to offend alumni or donors or future support from foundations or government. So they do investigate, but only in response to when a whistleblower usually uh, says there's an issue. They're not doing enough audits. They're not doing enough regular checks routine checks to see, is the data there? Do they have the images uh, there? Is, are they keeping good notebooks to record their findings in? Need more of that. Now, I'm gonna say one other thing. I think we need more transparency. Mm -hmm. Investigations done, NYU, Columbia, the Charité Hospital, wherever, mm -hmm. they're still anonymous. You can't really see what's going on. And I think that leads to too much fraud. You know, this this big story um, was about cancer research, stomach cancer research. It caught my attention because there's a personal story here. My, my mother was diagnosed with gastric cancer. And I remember when that happened, the first thing I did and I, for many years afterwards was read as much as I could in these medical journals to know so that I could talk on, you know, eye to eye with the oncologist and, and the surgeons. I was thinking about this story, though, maybe p parents relatives who advocate for their loved ones, if they're relying on these journals, are they actually pushing and championing treatments that could hurt and kill the people they're trying to save? Not often, but sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes there's so much hope that you don't really listen to the risk and the benefit, or you look in a journal, you kind of journal shop and you say, ah, I found one that's positive about this drug for let's say pancreatic cancer, notoriously tough to cure. I'm gonna chase that researcher down. But it's not a good journal necessarily. It's not been a strategy that others are using. So yes, look at the literature, good advocate can do that. Got to ask questions and make sure you know what journals you're looking at. Mm -hmm. They're not all equal. Access to information, before we let you go, you know, we've got access to information like never before. Our ability to filter that, you know, our, our information diet, is it as good and as healthy as it should be, particularly when we're talking about medical research? No. The internet is rife with misinformation, crackpot theories. I see again and again, not just the mainstream, trying to struggle to make sure it stays with high standards of integrity, but there's just a lot on social media that I see that I don't trust or I know to be false. Yeah. So that isn't the last place to look. It may be the first, it should never be the last. Yeah. Medical ethicist Arthur Kaplan. Mr. Kaplan, as always, we appreciate your time, valuable analysis. Have a good weekend.